good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joseph Safi Harb. I'll be the moderator of the of the science stage. We'll be competing with our friends uh, from this side in terms of noise. Um, what we've just witnessed is a video that talks about recognizing the right innovations that can really uh, transform different industries. So, for example, the mobile phone, um, the uh, the way we communicate with self, the way we take pictures. And today, a very important subject, which is um, agriculture. So with the change in economics, uh, technology, uh, it has become more than ever important for the farmer to stay relevant and to uh, be able to produce uh, in, a, in a way that it's economically viable. And our next speaker, and before I introduce you, I'd like to ask, are there any Brazilians uh, with us today? Because I've heard there's a lot, a lot of people here. And our next spe speaker has been born and raised in Brazil. He serves as a member of the executive board of the Rabobank. And he is able, uh, he has been able for the first time for a bank to set up a mission statement uh, related to feeding 9 billion people by 2050. Please welcome on the stage, Berry Martin. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, welcome everybody. Anybody has farming background here? Okay, I would like, anybody ever slept at the farm? Oh, that's good. That's already a little bit better. So, anybody ha had to harvest its own food once? Oh, that's good. That's good, right? So, you know what I'm going to talk about. So. Oh, yes, I'm Brazilian. I'm born and raised in Brazil. I started working for Rabobank in Brazil many years ago. Yes, and I'm also a farmer. I have my own farm, a family farm in Brazil. That's me in my crop. So um, I hope that uh, while we talk here, we can discuss because, yes, far food is a big issue. Producing food for 9 billion people, and a lot of people already say 10 billion people by 2050, is going to be a big issue because we actually don't know exactly how to do it because we have never done it, right? So it's recognized the challenge. We know it's going to be an issue. We are writing about it, but nobody really putting its heads around how we're going to do it. Why it's such a big issue? It's because it's very important. First, it's economically very important because 10% of the world's economy and certainly of the country you are in right now is dependent on the food and agri. The world thinks or we think that in the next 15 years, every 15 to 20 years, the sales of food at the counter, so at the supermarket or through the restaurant, grows by almost 70 to 100 percent. And in 2050, we will need to produce 60 percent more food. And you know why this is so relevant? Because we don't have more earth. On the contrary, we need to have less land to produce. We will have less land to produce this amount of food because of two reasons. One, we need the biodiversity back because we're using too much land already. And secondly, we have an issue that we have urbanization going on. So the more people we have, they have to live somewhere. And it just happens to be that most of the people like to live in deltas, right? Where, use, where we used to, to farm. Anybody recognize this? Is this new? No, huh? But you, do we have the solution? Can you help us for the solution? Because we want to eat. So, and it's socially very important thing. Think about every, every minute, every minute, almost 100 and the, the world grows almost 160 people. So while we are sitting here, the world already grew a couple of hundred. Think about it, 160 newborns, net growth every minute. But while we're doing that, every day, almost a billion people go with hunger to bed. And at the same time, two billion people go to bed overweight. Think about it. It's just the numbers are staggering. And we are all very comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that. And our organization as Rabobank is also not comfortable with that. So we came, considering our background, the, our roots in food and agri, we came and said, look, we want to help, we want to contribute to feed nine, feeding 9 billion people by 2050. And we have said there are four ways of movements we can help. One, 
is we want to help to increase the availability of food. We want to support farmers to produce more. Not only big farmers, also small farmers. There are 550 million farmers in the world. 500 million of them have less than an hectare to live on. They are smallholder farmers. They are smallholder farmers and almost cannot survive. We want to improve access because you can produce food like we do here in the Netherlands and other places, but it doesn't reach the end. It doesn't reach the people that need the food. We want to talk about nutrition. We want to, who had fruit today? You know, that's not enough, right? That's not enough. And who had fruit and vegetables already today? It's already almost one o'clock, right? Only two people. And you know, that's not enough. That's not healthy food, sorry. No, we need to eat vegetables and fruit every day. So nutrition is a big issue. And the third thing, a fourth thing is, is that we want to be resilient. How many times per day do you eat? One, two, three, four, all the time, <laughs> never stopping, right? So it has to be resilient because it has to be there every day, all the time. We have to make sure that not only distributed right, but it has to be resilient and consistent. So that's where we are committing ourselves as an organization. We do it through financing, of course, we are a bank. I just before I came here, I was in Wageningen for the Food and Agri Next. For the first time, startups putting together with uh, venture capital uh, funds. We, have, we can do knowledge. We have a lot of knowledge as Rabobank worldwide. We operate in almost uh, 50 countries and we can bring people together and the networks. Is this new? No? Good. So we're doing good marketing. Well, how are we going to solve the problem? If you want to double the food production, FO estimates that you cannot do it by more arable land because there is no more arable land. You know, there, there is arable land, to be very honest, but it's all in Africa and a little bit in Latin America. So we have no, we cannot expand anymore. It cannot be by more intensity. You know, cropping means that instead of doing one farm, you do two uh, uh, har uh, harvests a year. That's also not really much. You cannot do much more there. So almost all has to come from more yield. And if I look around here, you are very young. Who knows how to increase yield? We don't know. We have been trying and we have been big issues. But it's not only yield increase is going to solve, and that's where I think you will have a big impact. It's also reducing waste. Who of you think about food waste every day? That's very good. You know that we as humans throw away a third, a quarter to a third of all food we produce. So one calorie in every three. And half of those way of those this waste is actually done in the Western world at the supermarket and at our homes. And very simple technologies can be applied to solve this problem. The first is you've been conscious about that. But the second one is just doing simple devices. Who knows what well, this is a spaghetti meter. You know, if you use a spaghetti meter, you consume 20% less spaghetti. An average spaghetti package is for five people. Who has more than five people at home? No, right? Usually, you, the, uh, the average household is two to three people. So the package we buy, it's already too much. So a spaghetti meter reduces in 20% your consumption. Who has a spaghetti meter? Well, only four people. You know, you are wasting. So everybody put their hands up when you are thinking about consciousness about food waste, but only four of you use spaghetti meters. So think about it, OK? Who would like to buy a spaghetti meter? You still know only three. Who would like to get a spaghetti meter? Ah, oh, you see, this is a good world. Um, but, okay, so of course we can reduce waste. But the next revolution in yield, because we had the green revolution already. So the green revolution is behind us. So the green revolution was mechanization, fertilizers, pesticides, and we all know what happened. And the next revolution in, in, on the farm, after the farm, it cannot be like this. We cannot put more fertilizer because we are already doing too much. We cannot put more pesticides because that's already too much. So the next revolution has to come from something else. And we think 
that the first step for the next revolution is going to be big data. Big data. But not a collection of data, because we have enough sensors in the world, is who is going to discover the right algorithm to manage this data? Who is going to be able to store this data and, and process it in such a way that you can use it to improve the yields on the farm by smart farming? by having actually not only the farm producing, but actually the farm producing what people want to buy. If you think about the farmer today, a farmer plants, harvests, and then is going to sell his product, and hopefully somebody is going to buy it. But if you think about it, that's completely wrong, because we should actually know what you're going to eat and what you want to eat, and based from that, we're going to produce, because we have scarcity in land, we, we will produce what people are going to buy, want to eat. We just don't do that. Today, farmers produce for the open market. And what happens, you produce a lot, you have to store it, it's not fresh anymore, and then we don't want to consume it. That's what's really going on. So I, my dream is really that the day that you buy an egg, that the same moment that you bought the egg, a leg goes on at the, at the front of a chicken, and the chicken legs puts an egg. Why could not be? Technology should be able to do that, right? So we have a, no, well, we control that because the problem is that we, the, uh, the chicken produces the eggs and we actually don't know exactly if somebody is going to buy that egg. We only will lay long later. So we have too much eggs in the, in the pipeline. Drones, very important. Not only for precision farming, but also because of one, the, the second most important uh, constraint for farming. Who knows, land is one constraint, but what's the second biggest constraint? Water. We don't have enough water. And we all, as we are here, we are competing with farmland for the use of water. Farm today already uses almost 70% of all freshly available water in the world. If you have to double production, there is no 140% water available in the world. So we will have to be efficient. And the beauty of drones is that they will be able to measure constantly the humidity what the plant needs by flying over the crop and by sending signals to machines with underwater e underground irrigating so that they will throw water exactly where you need when you need it and peop some experts say that we can save up to 80 percent of the need so drones are going to be important for that but what drones also going to be important for is that we can reduce the use of pesticides with drones why we use pesticides just because we want to produce more, right? Because we, we don't want the insects competing with, with the farmer for the plants. So drones are going to be key to identify pests, more importantly, maybe to even kill the bugs. Because if you put the laser thing on the drone, what could they do is just kill the bug on the plant. Couldn't do it? Think about it, no? You fly around and bam, no? And so you don't need to do the pesticides. You have to think, we have to think differently. You are all young here. You are just, you have to think, these are opportunities. It's a great opportunity. I told you, we have to double production and we don't know how. We only have half of the, we don't have more resources. You know how many hectares we have per inhabitant right now? Yeah, because we need land to eat, right? So we have more or less between 0 0.9 and 1 hectare per inhabitant. In 2050, we'll have only half hectare per inhabitant. Just, we're going to have much more need to increase that production. So that's also the issue. And I'm, I'm sure that by 2050, we will not be planting on Mars. We will not be able to get food out of the moon. So we will have to do it ourselves here. Is this new? It's a big challenge. And that's where we are standing for as Rabobank. The, the other thing, as I said, is that there's a lot of smallholder farmers. The interesting thing about farming is it's not actually the quality of the land and the climate that determines it is the most important factor for productivity. The blue line here, the, 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 the light blue, is actually the climatological effects and quality of the land. And you see there's no correlation with the yields you're getting. Actually, the yields are correlated actually to social enabling factors. Actually, factors which we can influence as humanity to produce more. 
which are laws, access to finance, access to technology, logistics, education, willingness of young people to go and farm. All those things are key and essential for productivity. So even with low tech, by means of having new ideas of how you deploy ideas, you can have a lot of growth in the yield of what we do. An average farmer in Africa is only producing two tons per hectare of mice. Here in the Netherlands, which is one of the most advanced, we are between 10 and 12 tons per hectare on average. So it's a huge difference. And it is not only mechanization. It's really people need to know how to farm. And we have to help them to do it. Who, who ever went to Africa? That's good. Who went to a farm in Africa and helped them to produce more? We need them because they're actually importing 20% of all the food we produce because they cannot do it themselves. So if we want to feed ourselves in the future, we will have to have Africa producing. And we do a lot for it. You know, there's no Brazilian here, so only me. So I recognize him. This is Mr. Graziano, a Brazilian, by the way. And he is the chairman of the FAO. So we as Rabobank made an agreement with FAO that together with our foundation, we are going to support farmers in Africa. And we're already doing two million far supporting two million farmers. Actually, the end of this year will be five million and doing something like 200 projects constantly. So because we need those farmers, those 500 million farmers, half of them in, most than, more than half of them in Africa to start producing four, five, six tons per hectare. That's really a must. And you have to support them. No? And we will have to go out as youngsters to make it happen. This is one of the projects we do. This is in Tanzania. Who has ever been in Tanzania? Arusha? Beautiful place, Arusha, isn't it? This is very simple. Those 5,000 dairy farmers, because you're going to do a dairy hackathon, right? That's why you're here. The shirt says, no, dairy hackathon. Those 5,000 farmers, they had zebu cows. And zebu cow is only giving two to three liters milk per day. So if you have a calf, two liters go to the calf, one liter goes to the, to the factory, it's not enough to survive, right? So because on average, you only make 50 to 60 cents per liter. We asked farmers, Dutch farmers, and they made the mixture, the genetic crossing of the Zebu farm with a, with, a, with a heifer, with a Frisian, and now they're producing between six and 10 liters. But two liters still go to the calf, but now they have six liters more to seven liters more to sell to the factory. We help them to establish a factory, a, mil, uh, a, a, a dairy processing unit, have a brand. Now those farmers sell the product. And what happens, instead of making 60 cents every day, they are making between 4 and $5 every day. And that makes the difference. Sometimes it's so simple like that. And they have the same amount of cows. They don't need to do anything more. Big challenge. It's not only more people in the world that's the issue. It's that we are getting wealthier. The middle class consumers does much more than the non-middle class. You know, if you eat beef, you know how much more you consume in protein than the most efficient ones? You know? You don't know, otherwise you would answer, right? So, an insect, beef is 12 times less efficient protein than if you would eat insects. Really. So... You now you had the cakes of Rabobank, you were walking around, you got the, the cookie, right? That's were insect cookies. So that's very efficient for you. Thank you for eating them because they are the most efficient protein that we know today. An insect is 12 times more efficient in producing protein than the cows we eat. So that's for me a very essential because we cannot do it. You know, it's not possible uh, uh, to feed everybody if we will not think about other things like algae, insects and all those other things. Uh, solutions. But the big challenge of the world is going to be how to feed Asia. The middle class, growing middle class in Asia. And if you want to break, make a business case, you know that you are in a world that has scarcity, uh, knowing a world that is growing rapidly, you know that's doubling the, the sales of, uh, of food stuff, but you also know where it's going to happen, is where the middle class growth is going to be. And that growth is in Asia. India and China, Indonesia, and those, this region. But there is a small problem. And this is the biggest problem, is that, yes, I told you that there is a scarcity of land coming up. There's a growth of people, especially middle class in Asia. 
But there is something else going on, is that the availability of land where you can produce is not in Asia. So here you can see that today, and we know it's going to grow, 60% of the people live in Asia. But Asia only has 35% of the available land. So there is, and their percentage of people in the world is going to grow. So that percentage is even going to be more screwed. So where you have land available, that's, look, Africa ha is in, is, has 50% of the people and 50% of the available land, but imports 20% of all the food needs. And if you look at the big ones, the Americas, including South America, they, they can produce and export. So there are regions in the world that also will export to the regions that, that don't have enough availability of land. So those are a lot of things happening at the same time. It's not for nothing that you all have seen, the ones that read the financials, that the Chinese companies are making big moves into this space. Not only by buying organizations in the sense of trading companies, but they also buy in technology. You have heard about Syngenta being acquired by, uh, by a Chinese uh, conglomerate. You have heard Kofco going out there and buying Nidera and buying um, Noble. So you see a big big movement. You see them going into Africa trying to secure some of, of the, the land and, and, and the sources. So that's something that's happening and it's not for nothing. It's because they look at this and that's a very important development. So we are here about technology. We are here talking about innovation. You all are here uh, thinking about what's the next, how can I help, what can I hack, what can I do in IT. But this is very important. So genetic, smart breeding, very good thing. The drone I talked about, and insects. No, without bees, we don't have food. But the beauty of bees is that they fly around and they go to every, every plant. So why don't using bees in the future to deploy the things we want? Because they don't go there anyhow. We don't need to spray. We don't need to go over. We just put it in a bee. Why could they not transport it? They, they go empty to the, to the flower, right? Because they have no pollen. So they go empty. Why you don't put something on them so that they take it there, right? And then they come back full, right? Then they, they make the honey, and then they go back with something you want them to deploy. So it's very natural, and it's easy. Why not? That could be an invention you would, could do. Why not? No? Ideas. No? Sensors. Why don't we have an app on our telephone? We have the minus megabytes and digital and, and sharpness, what makes up megapixels, we call that. Why can we not take a picture of something and see if it's still good or not? Because we all know that bad food has some kind of, of bacteria on it. Why can we not take a picture of a food and say it's still good, it's not good? Why we have not developed that technology while well, everybody is a mobile? What we do is look, oh, it's always past you and we throw it away. But we have kept it for a week in the, in the fridge on the best conditions. Maybe it's still, still fresh, but why do we do it? Why we don't change the way we think, right? Why at schools we only sell, you go at school, why at schools we only sell Coca-Cola and we don't sell very natural food? Who had apples in the vending machine at school? Only two people. No? Incredible, right? And we all know that we need to eat fruits. So how can it be that our young people are not hooked up in the vending machine with apples and milk and all very, who had actually, what other soft drinks in the, in the vending machine at school. Yeah. Who had, a, who had no vending machine at school? Yeah, no, oh, sorry for that. <laughs> I had vending machine at school, right? And the insects, it's, who had already had insects for food? Uh, of course, today. Did you taste, did it taste bad? It was good, right? Nothing wrong with it. No, so great, why not? No, we have to think differently. Our big issue in food today is that we have not been able to convene the new things to the people. We still have images which are wrong. You think about insects, you say, Ugh, right? What's that? No, why? Vegetarian burger, what's wrong with that? No, nothing wrong with that. Huh? So, I, um, I want to, to slowly conclude, but technology is also in banking. So in banking, we also have been starting to say, okay, how, what can we do? So as obviously I told you, we are doing the finance and network, but now we are working on what I call the farmers BNB. We call it global farmers. That's uh, because we are trying to uh, build up for our customers globally 
a big network of farmers in the whole world so that they can go from Australia to the US, to the Netherlands, to Brazil, to Chile, all the places where we are, Africa, where we have clients, so they can share globally the nice things uh, we have to offer. Because really, one thing you have to know, I've experienced that myself, if you are in the farming community, you are sometimes very isolated and you want to have friends around. So that's why, please continue to stay at farm because I've, I'm absolutely sure they love to have uh, your visit there. I, um, I would like... Um, to conclude that uh, I, I, I hope that I give you some idea and give you some sparkling about the big challenge we have with each other. It's not obvious that we are going to be able to food, the feed, sorry, the 9 to 10 billion people. We don't know. Some say 9 out of 10 billion people by 2050. And certainly, I think it's unfair that we every day still have a billion people going with hunger to bed. And it's our challenge to be able to feed us all by 2050. So, thank you very much. Barry, I think uh, it might be interesting to ask a couple more questions from the crowd. Oh, okay. I, I had one question is, what is one thing we could do that uh, we have no excuse whatsoever that we're not lazy? We, because the challenge is like you've asked around and not a lot of hands went up when you, you have a spaghetti meter. Do you have this? Do you have... Uh, do you keep track of your fruit? What is like one thing the laziest person ever could do and contribute to this mission? Uh, well, it starts, I think it starts simply what you buy. Don't buy too much. Just buy what you need. Just buy what you need and okay. consume what you need. You know how much you eat. You know, and if you one day throw away rice out of your plate, you say, well, maybe I cook too much. So can I just do 10%? It's just a conscious that every day, that you throw away food, you say, okay, can I do less? Yeah. Can I adjust and can I buy smaller portions? Okay, yeah? that's, that's a good one. Yeah, um, it's easy. And, and, and use the spaghetti meter, right? <laughs> Are there any questions in the crowd? Hi, good, good, afterno good afternoon. My name is uh, Evan. Hi, Evan. Hi. Uh, I just had one, uh, one question, because um, you were talking about well, uh, people uh, throwing things away. Wouldn't it be an, uh, um, a problem solved if the price of a cert certain products would, I mean, uh, would go up? If, if it's that cheap, then somehow we think, well, you know, I'll, uh, I mean, spaghetti doesn't cost anything for us. Well, I, I think you cannot influence the market, uh, to be very honest. Oh, sorry. I think influencing the market is, is, is different. It's sorry, I will get there. So, um, uh, yes, cheap, yes. It's cheap for you. But if you're in Africa, it's damn expensive. Because in Africa, if you make less than a dollar a day, a spaghetti is very expensive. And actually, it's a luxury. So it's, it's, you have to be very aware that you should not be looking through your eyes. You should be looking at the eyes of the other 5 billion people that don't have so much income. We actually, we don't think about food because maybe food is 15 to 20% of our costs, or maybe 10%. So if food goes up 50%, for us, it's just a certain percentage income, of our disposable yeah. income. The, but the, the whole Arab revolution that we have in Tunisia, what's happening in Syria, is actually based, happened the moment that food prices, actually bread prices went up, as a, as a consequence of the drought we had in Ukraine and, and Russia, because all the, the grains that are imported into that northern part of Africa and, 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 and Middle East is coming from that region. You remember when uh, Russia closed the border? It's then suddenly the price went up, and then with that, because for them, the food is 56% of their expenditure. So be aware, don't look at it from our lenses, be aware, look at that from the lenses of others. But, so if you would use less food, you have more food availability in the world, so it actually would get better prices. We have another question over here. One second. It's, it's off. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Hi, uh, th thanks a lot for the for the uh, the, the talk. Uh, I have I haven't seen so I haven't heard so many talks because it's it's just Thursday. But I think that by far it's one of the most interesting talks uh, we are going to have because they just the the numbers talks by themselves. Um, um, I think that I, I know more or less how the, the things goes, and actually, it's not the, the Chinese who are going to buy the most of, of lands, but 
great fund investments like Goldman Sachs are the ones who are buying the most lands in Africa because they are uh, um, like seeing what is, is, is going. Um, I think that uh, I know you, you want to, to hear some ideas to uh, like use the big data and so on because it's the, the trend. But I think that um, it's, uh, it's, uh, you are mixing th different worlds. You know, the, the developed world and the Africa world. And the things that like uh, to select the, the food, the, the, the good uh, food. Can you like ask a question? Yeah. Um, I, th uh, I just think that, um, well, actually, I don't have a question. It's just, uh, it's just an, op an a opinion. A statement. That's yes, okay. Uh, it's That's just right. That's fair. Okay. Just no, the, the, the reality is, in my view, is that food is, uh, is becoming a global business. The reality is that with the, uh, with the reduction of the cost of transportation and the reduction of barriers, more and more food is going to be uh, a global business. So uh, yesterday we, I was in, uh, in Wageningen and we are looking at ideas. And even milk nowadays is already going to be able to be transported by 50 days. Fresh milk without even processing. Today we only transport powder milk or cheese, processed milk. And even fresh milk they want already to, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to go uh, all over the world. And regarding investments and land, the reality is, is that most of the land is owned by, by, uh, by, by farmers themselves. That's our experience. And, and yes, there are funds trying to invest uh, in all those things, but the reality is that, um, uh, that they is just more that they're trying to diversify the portfolio, really, than that they're going to make big strides. I don't see that, to be very honest. I think I'm more worried about how to keep the 500 million farmers that have less than two hectares on their land and that they, are get, get, don't, get, uh, uh, they don't get uh, spoiled or, or uh, in, in taste to, to leave it because there's no place for them in the urban areas. So I think that's our responsibility. How are we going to make that those people with small holding can make enough living so that they will stay there and that their offspring can also survive on less than two hectares? I think that's going to be the big challenge. And that challenge, the big, the big money is not going to solve. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, a big round of applause. Uh.